Hello everyone and welcome to a summary of my attempt to recreate the International Space Station and Kerbal Space Program with Realism Overhaul. I'll discuss the real missions and how what I did differed from them, but for further details you'll have to watch the full series. I did all these missions during live streams so there was full transparency and accountability. Unfortunately, I was also talking over the missions so we won't have the original mission audio. So first we had the launch of Zarya on a Proton-K on November 20th, 1998, and this was followed two weeks later by the launch of Unity, PMA-1, and PMA-2 on the shuttle Endeavour on mission STS-88. I should mention right up front that the shuttle missions are not numbered necessarily in order. That's a complication, so keep that in mind. But this was December 4th, 1998, and the commander was Robert D. Cabana, his fourth and last mission. The pilot was Fred Sturko. It was his first mission. The mission specialists were Jerry Ross, his sixth mission, Nancy Curry, her third mission, James Newman, his third mission, and Sergei Krikalev, his fourth mission. Sergei Krikalev, of course, one of the most storied uh, cosmonauts, spending 803 days in orbit, and VP of the Energia Corporation, which is the primary Russian corporation involved in the ISS. So here we have the shuttle using the ARM, Canada ARM, to move the Unity module to its own docking port, so attaching PMA-2 to its docking port and then attaching PMA-1 to Zarya. PMA stands for Pressurized Mating Adapter and basically it converts between the A-Pass system used by the Russians, well it's one of the types of Russian docking ports, so the A-Pass system and the common berthing mechanism which is the main way that uh, things dock together on the American side. And the shuttle has an A-Pass system on it so it'll always dock on a PMA, but other visiting missions uh, like, for instance, for instance, an ATV will dock at a common berthing mechanism because they have that. Now, the shuttle was supposed to land at Kennedy, at uh, Cape Kennedy, the shuttle landing facility, runway 15, and that was on December 16th. Unfortunately, it's always going to be the case that trying to land the shuttle where it's supposed to be landed is a difficulty for me, and that'll be a trend during this video, so sorry about that. It ended up somewhere in South Carolina that time. Sometimes I'll get it to where it's supposed to go. But here we have the launch of Zvezda on a Proton-K. This was July 12th, 2000, and it's going to dock on the aft docking port of Zarya. I don't know why I didn't have the UI up for this launch. I guess I was in a cinematic mood. Uh, this is about as heavy a thing as you can launch on a Proton-K, so you have to make sure to get the mass right. It's 20.32 tons. You'll have some varying numbers out there, but uh, well, you'll know it's too heavy because your Proton won't be able to launch it. So, uh, yep, it actually takes two weeks to get to the station to dock, so it's probably underfueled a bit, uh, and they had to be very careful with the fuel to make sure it docked. And a little secret, I actually used, I, I actually ran out of fuel, so I used a little Delta tug to push the Zvezda in. It ran out of fuel just parked outside the station. So, full accountability there. Anyway, so here is the launch of the Z1 Trust and PMA-3 on STS-92, the shell Discovery, launching on October 11th, the year 2000. The Z1 Trust has the, well, what is basically the reaction wheels, or however you want to uh, call them. Uh, and it also has the adapters and connections for the between the space station and the trusses, the solar trusses. So PMA-3 is another pressurized mating adapter. And the commander for this mission was Brian Duffy, his fourth and last mission. The pilot was Pamela Melroy, her first. And the mission specialists were Koichi Wakata, or Wakata Koichi, uh, his second mission, William MacArthur, his third mission, Peter Weissoff, his fourth and last mission, Michael Lopez Alegria, his second mission, and Leroy Chow, his third mission. There were four EVAs to get all the attachments together. I just used the Canada arm there, and so I attached the Z1 truss to the Zenit docking port of Unity, and PMA-3 gets attached to the Nadir docking port of Unity, the bottom, the Earth-facing docking port of Unity. So uh, the first EVA was by Chow and MacArthur, the second by Lopez, Alegria, and Weissoff, the third EVA by Chiao and MacArthur again, and the fourth EVA by Lopez, Allegria, and Weissoff. 
Now I had a little bit of a problem with the reach of my cannon arms, so instead of directly placing PMA-3 on the nadir port, I had to reposition the shuttle first in order to get the arm to be able to place it there, so I temporarily put PMA-3 on one side of Unity and did that. I also think I put an extra joint in my cannon arm to make things easier. Uh, the, the complexities of all this. And here we go with the shuttle's return. Uh, the shuttle is supposed to land at uh, Edwards Air Force Base on this mission, and that's on October 24th, but there is nothing at Edwards Air Force Base in the game, uh, so I decided to just bring it back to Kennedy. Technically, the re-entry script that I use, which I wrote, uh, can bring it down anywhere, uh, but I've only really tested out with uh, Cape Canaveral, and in this case, we get back to the runway, though there's a little bit of skidding, so... Yes, the landing gear is a little bit tricky on these things. Anyway, the next launch is on November 30th, the year 2000, and it's the P6 Trust in Arrays. So this is the first main array delivered to the station, and it's uh, going to be temporarily placed on the top of the Z1 Trust. Uh, it is 15.8 tons, among the heaviest things that the shuttle can bring to the station. And this is STS-97 Endeavor, with Commander Brent Jett, Brent Jett Jr., pilot Michael Bloomfield, and uh, it was Brent Jett's third mission, uh, Michael Bloomfield's second mission, and the mission specialists were Joe Tanner, his third mission, Mark Arnaud, his third and last mission, and uh, mission specialist Carlos Noriega, his second and last mission. And when I say last, I mean the last so far, uh, on the off chance that they get to be space tourists someday, I don't know. So, uh, three EVAs were conducted by Tanner and Noriega, and we see the truss being placed at the top. Now, I didn't position it quite right because my arm couldn't reach, so for a while the solar panels are going to be tilted. Uh, there's uh, going to be a skew with respect to the station, so yeah. Fortunately, uh, the shuttle was supposed to land at Kennedy, so that much is correct. And it looks like we're on a good flight path for that. It landed on December 11th. And we do indeed bring it down. Though my split rudder seems a little bit weird. We're going quite fast too. But... Can we make it? Okay. Slow down please. Before the end of the runway. The drag shoots. I think the shit only has one. I forget. Actually, uh, right there, when the camera tilted, the shuttle reared up and hit its tail. Oops. But, yep, okay, well at least we stopped by the end of the runway. Next up is the launch of the Destiny module, 14.5 tons, on STS-98, the shuttle Atlantis. This was launched February 7th, the year 2001. The commander was Kenneth Cockrell, his fourth mission. Mark Polanski was the pilot, his first mission. The mission specialists were Robert Kerbeam, his second. Marsha Ivins, her fifth and last. And Thomas Jones, his fourth and last mission. So here we are approaching the station. The EVAs were conducted by Jones and Kerbeam, and uh, there were three of those. Here we are docking to PMA-3 because we have to move PMA-2. PMA-2 is in the location where the Destiny module eventually goes. So this is one of those times where, as you can see, we're using the arm to move the PMA, and then we can dock the Destiny module there, and then uh, PMA2 eventually goes on the end of the Destiny module. So, just gently placing that. This is all very tricky. Honestly, using Canada arm... Ooh. That's, that was rough. Using Canada Arm took as long during these live streams as it seems to in real life. It took me maybe two, three hours for to get all the positioning done. I mean, real life is probably longer, but they also have the benefit of having somebody plan it out for them and to train for all this. I did not do that. So here we go, putting the PMA2 at the end of Destiny there. It was a long reach, but then the shuttle got to undock. And for the most part, the shuttle docks at PMA-2. It doesn't often dock at PMA-3, only when it needs to, and I think there's only two occasions. This is one of them. 
So on the return here, uh, this was supposed to be landing at Edwards on February 20th. Instead, of course, back at Cape Canaveral. But can we make it? Well, uh, we look a little bit high there, don't we? Yeah, uh, so I end up splashing down in the water because I overshot. For those familiar with how easy it is to land shuttles in stock Kerbal Space Program, please remember that the surface area of the Earth is more than 100 times larger, we come in three times faster, and it is a lot harder here, so forgive me, but I'll try my best. Anyway, uh, this is the launch of Canadarm2 on STS-100, the shuttle Endeavour, launching April 19th, 2001. There was a mission that carried an external stowage platform, uh, that was STS-102 about a month earlier than this, but I'm not covering the external storage platform, so I didn't do those. So that was the shuttle discovery on that one. For this mission, the commander was Kent Rominger, and his fifth and last mission, pilot was Jeffrey Ashby, his second mission. The mission specialists were, of course, Chris Hadfield, his second mission, Canadarm2, uh, he was involved in placing it. And we can imagine this Kerbal is uh, Chris Hadfield, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, but mainly Canadarm2 did most of Canadarm2's work uh, during this, but what the Kerbal there did was place what was essentially a docking port for a Canadarm2. If that, uh, this Canadarm2 just uses its end effectors to attach, which it can do, it can attach using just its end effectors without a little docking port, a grappling point, um, it will float off when using time warp. So you can't just leave it like that. But uh, yep, so we placed Canadarm2 there. The other mission specialists were John L. Phillips, uh, his first mission, Scott Parazinski, his fourth mission, Umberto Guidoni, his second and last mission, and Yuri Lonchikov, his first mission. The two EVAs were conducted by Parazinski and Hadfield. The landing was supposed to be at Edwards for this, I'm landing at Cape Canaveral. After this mission, there were two missions that I launched a recording of. I lost a recording of the Quest Airlock launch on STS-104, the shuttle Atlantis, and that was supposed to be on July 12th, 2001. That's with uh, Commander Stephen Lindsay, his third mission, pilot Charles Hobal, his uh, first mission, and mission specialist Michael uh, Gernhard, his fourth and last, Janet Cavandi, her third and last, and James Riley, his second. Uh, but I lost a recording of that one, and I also lost the recording of the Piers launch on Soyuz U, and that is a docking module that's attached to the Nadir port of Zvezda, launched on September 14th, 2001. And the loss of the recordings is basically because I abandoned the project and came back to it two years later uh, with this launch, uh, STS-110, the shuttle Atlantis bringing up the S-0 truss on April 8th, 2002. It's a 14-ton truss, and I came back to it and converted the version of Kerbal Space Program to 1.3.1, uh, which is not the most up-to-date version at this point when I came back to it, but it was the most up-to-date version that I could get everything compatible in. Uh, but I decided to save myself some trouble. One reason I quit was basically because of how difficult it had been to use Canadarm. So instead of using Canadarm for placing the further modules, which would have been even worse because from here on out, it requires a combination of both Canadarm 1 and Canadarm 2, the one on the space shell and the one on the station. I created these little tugs, and these tugs would make it easier for me to move the modules quickly so that the missions wouldn't take quite so much time. The mission time using the tugs was about three hours for a full shuttle mission. Other than that, it was maybe four or five hours, so it is a substantial difference. So here we are placing the S0 truss, which is the backbone of all the solar trusses, and it's placed on top of the Destiny module and connected to the Z1 truss, so the wires basically go through the Z1 truss. And uh, here I'm using the tugs to reposition the P6 truss. It's not attached to the S0 truss yet, even though it's got solar panels and everything. Uh, just to uh, tilt them so that they weren't askew anymore. So there we go, the tugs did their thing. The astronauts launched on this mission were Commander Michael Bloomfield, his third and last mission. Stephen Frick was the pilot, his first mission. Rex Walheim was the first mission specialist. The other mission specialists were Ellen Ochoa, her fourth and last mission. Lee Morin, his first and last mission. Uh, Jerry uh, Ross, his seventh and last mission. And Stephen Smith, his fourth and last mission. And when, again, when I say last, I mean 
the, the last that we know of. <laughs> so uh, here the shuttle is not quite managing to get back to Cape Canaveral and the conversion to KSP 1.3.1 did produce serious problems for me as far as getting the shuttle back to where it belongs and basically it'll take to the end of the series until I finally am comfortable regularly bringing it back to Cape Canaveral. Uh, so here we are launching the S1 truss on STS-112, the shuttle Atlantis again, and this was on October 7th, 2002. Prior to this, uh, on STS-111, the shuttle Endeavour brought the mobile base system on uh, Ju uh, June 5th, 2002, but I don't even know how to get the mobile base system to work in Kerbal Space Program, much less uh, carry it on. So maybe someday I'll add it to my station, but it didn't get brought up here. So. Uh, the S-1 truss will be installed on the starboard side of the S-0 truss. The commander for this mission was Jeff Ashby, his third and last mission. Uh, pilot was Pam Melroy, her second. And the mission specialists were Piers Sellers, his first. Sandra Magnus, her first. David Wolf, his third. And Fyodor uh, Yurchikin, Yurchikin, I think, uh, his first mission. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. The EVAs were conducted by Wolf and Sellers, and there were three of them. So here we go, placing the solar truss with the tugs and getting tugs back into the bay. So relatively simple now, but you can see as the we attach trusses further and further out, there's no way that the space shuttle's arm is going to be able to reach those, and that's where Canada Arm 2 comes in. And that would have probably taken even longer than the earlier shuttle missions where I had to use the arm. Uh, this is, well, we were close to Cape Canaveral. You can see I've got it targeted there. You can see the distance there indicates the distance to the Cape, but uh, we didn't quite make it. So next up is the launch of the P-1 truss, the one on the port side that matches the S-1 truss on the starboard side. This was launched on November 23rd, 2002 on the Shuttle Endeavour STS-113. And again, it's a 14-ton piece, and the commander for this mission was James Weatherby, his sixth and last mission. Uh, Paul Lockhart was the pilot, his second and last mission. The mission specialists were Michael Lopez Alegria, his third. John Harrington, his first and last. Uh, Kenneth Bowersox, his fifth and last. Uh, Nikolai uh, Budarin, his third and last. And Donald Pettit, his first. So the EVAs will be conducted by Lopez Alegria and Harrington. I should mention that the previous mission, uh, SCS-112, did land at Kennedy. And this mission will also land at Kennedy, so we don't have any problems with that. I do hope to eventually get something to land at at Edwards. That would be nice. But here we go. The P-1 truss being carried by the drones or tugs, I don't know where you want to put it. The shuttle never actually used tugs, so this is a little bit of inaccuracy here for the sake of expediency. There was a proposal for the shuttle to use tugs to save Skylab. Those would be teleoperated tugs, uh, so on the shuttle astronauts would control the tugs, but there is also the matter of the tugs potentially damaging equipment inside the bay if, with their thrusters, it's a possibility, and so... But the, the astronauts could sort of shove it off out of the bay first and then start up its uh, reaction control system to control it. As you can see, we didn't manage to land the Cape Canaveral there, uh, but at least we landed on land. That's okay. After STS-113, there was a big gap in the actual missions because of the Columbia disaster, and so this is the next mission to bring a major module to the station, STS-115, the Shell Atlantis, bringing the P-3-P-4 truss and solar arrays on September 9th, 2006. And there was STS-114, the Shell Discovery, bringing a storage platform on uh, July 26, 2005, but I'm not covering those. Uh, so this mission had Commander Brent Jett Jr., his fourth and last mission, pilot Chris Ferguson, his first mission, and mission specialist Stephen McLean, his second and last, Daniel Burbank, his second, Joseph Tanner, his fourth and last, and Haida Marie uh, Stefanishin Piper, her first. 
and the EVAs were with uh, Tanner, Stefanish, and Piper, and with Burbank, McLean, and then another one with Tanner, Stefanish, and Piper. Uh, so that was how that went. Now you might notice that there's no P2 truss. There was a P1 truss, and this P3 slash P4 truss was attached to it. Uh, and that's because the P2 truss was part of the original plan that and it would have had some control thrusters on it, but that was negated by the addition of the Russian modules, Zarya and Zvezda, which have thrusters already, so they didn't need to put the P2 truss and do that. Now here, this landing also involved the explosion of the OMS pods, unfortunately. I managed to roll it onto the runway, so maybe that's progress. No, it's not really progress. Uh, it was a disaster, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we, we lost little bits uh, due to re-entry heating there. So, uh, next up is launching the P5 truss. So next truss is out on the port side. And this is on SDS-116, the Shuttle Discovery, on December 9th, 2006. And you'll note, I actually have my in-stream chat up. I wish I hadn't done that for this mission. Uh, but there you go. Yes, it was done during the live stream, and I did have chat going on. The P-5 truss launched on this mission is a very small spacer module. It's just 1.8 tons. It's basically a brace for the P-6 truss that will go onto it. So between the P-4 and P-6 truss. And uh, so they also put a space hab inside here, basically an extra living space module with experiments and such. And so that's also in the bay. And the commander was Mark Polanski, his second mission. Pilot William o Ophelin his first and last mission, and mission specialists were Nicholas Patrick, his first, Robert Kerbeam, his third and last, uh, Christer Fuglsang, his first, Joan Higginbotham, her first and last, and Sunita Suni Williams, her first. The EVAs were by, three of them were, the first, second, and fourth were by Kerbeam and Fuglsang, and the third was by Kerbeam and Williams. So here we go, you can see me, uh, sort of fold one end of the P6 truss there, its solar rays. That's how it was in the pictures, basically they folded up one side. As I understand it, they had trouble uh, folding up the P6 truss ahead of moving it to the end of the P5 truss. So that's, uh, that's the thing uh, with these big solar rays. Sometimes you don't want to fold back up again when you need them to. But here we are landing and... It's sort of a skew on the runway there, uh, not the not the best landing ever, but at least we're on the runway. And indeed, this mission did land at Kennedy, the shuttle landing facility, so that's good. So next up is the tr trusses on the other side. We added the P3, P4, P5. Now this launches the S3 and S4. P stands for port side, S stands for starboard side, so there's the starboard side, third and fourth, fourth truss, and the solar rays. And that's 15.8 tons, launching on STS-117, the shuttle Atlantis, on June 8th, 2007. Commander was Fred Sturko, and this is his third mission. Uh, Lee Archambault was the pilot, first mission. Uh, Patrick Forster was the first mission specialist, second mission for him. And the other mission specialists were Steven Swanson, John Olivas, uh, James Riley, and Clayton Anderson, first mission for all of them except for James Riley, uh, it was his third and last. So here we go, once again the tugs bring out the truss there, and again, uh, identical to the P3, P4 truss on the opposite side. Uh, the EVAs were conducted, the first one by Riley and Olivas, second by Forrester and Swanson, third by Riley and Olivas, and fourth by Forrester and Swanson. So even when I uh, show it with Canadarm, it must be understood that it's not just Canada Arm just placing the module, they have to do a whole lot of other business. Uh, basically all these modules, the EVAs take combined between uh, 20 and 24 hours, something like that. So it's a substantial amount of time outside to get everything properly working. And here, the mission was supposed to land at Edwards, and but of course, like I said, uh, I just consistently aimed at Cape Canaveral because there's nothing at Edwards. And we'll see where we end up. Doesn't look like we're close enough. Oh, no, we are. So, good times. I only really remember the times I missed, so... <laughs> uh, it's, it's good to see the runway. It's always good. 
So uh, following with the pattern though, you can uh, guess, and then basically all these missions are building out the solar arrays on the station to provide enough power for all the experiments that they run. Of course, the solar panels that they already have, the P6 Truss and the panels on Zvezda were able to power the life support and certain basic experiments. But before they add the Columbus module and the Kibo, the Japanese uh, experiment module, they will need more power. And that's why we're building out the, the solar trusses. And this is the launch of STS-118, the Shell Endeavor carrying the S-5 truss, which is again, just a spacer truss, 1.8 tons, launching on August 8th, 2007. And this mission carried Commander Scott Kelly on his second mission, Pilot Charles Hobaugh, second mission, Mission Specialists Tracy Caldwell, her first, Richard Mastracchio, his second, uh, Daffod Williams, his second and last, uh, Barbara Morgan, her first and last, and Alvin Drew, his first. The EVAs were conducted by Mastracchio and Williams, the first two. The third was Mastracchio and Anderson, and the fourth, Williams and Anderson. I was so pleased by the performance of these little tugs that I decided to create a custom model for them and add the Canadian flag to them, and that was for the last few missions I dubbed them Canada Tug in, in deference to Canada Arms since I wasn't using it. You can see some of the problems I had with the shuttle's stability there, which led to having to land elsewhere instead of Kennedy. And this mission was supposed to land at Kennedy, but did not, unfortunately. Had to land somewhere else in the middle of Florida. So here we go, launching STS-120, the shuttle Discovery, bringing up the Harmony module. Uh, which is 14.3 tons. It will be docked to the end of Destiny. It acts as a hub, uh, which will allow the docking of the Columbus module and also the Kibo module, the two labs. The European lab is the Columbus module, and the Kibo module is the Japanese lab. And this was launched on October 23rd, 2007, and carried Commander Pamela Melroy, the third and last mission for her. George Zamka was on his first mission and was the pilot. The mission specialists were Doug Wheelock, first mission, Stephanie Wilson, her second mission, Scott Parazinski, his fifth and last mission, Paolo Nispoli, his first mission, and Daniel Tani, his second and last mission. The EVAs, the first EVA was by Parazinski and Wheelock, second by Parazinski and Tani, and the third and fourth by pa uh, Parazinski and Wheelock. So as you saw, the Harmony module was temporarily placed on the side of Unity there, and then PMA-2 was moved to the Harmony module and then the Harmony module is then moved to the Destiny module where it eventually has to reside. And during this, of course, the shuttle had to reposition itself. Uh, the use of tugs here simplifies the matter. I was actually having trouble docking the shuttle in Kerbal Space Program 1.3.1 and that's because I couldn't control from the docking port. Uh, it produced some weird instability when telling uh, my systems either SAS or Smart ASS to hold steady kill rotation and they didn't seem to be able to do that so um, minor complication that meant that I couldn't dock properly for a while. Here we have the repositioning of the P6 truss it's been sitting at the top of the Z1 truss for a long time now but finally it gets to be placed on the port side where it belongs and we can unfurl that so the truss is mostly done except for the P6, uh, sorry, the S6 truss, the starboard side equivalent. So the drones go back inside the bay and their job is done. Lots of moving things about on this mission. And the landing was supposed to be at Kennedy. And we do see the shell approaching the Florida coast, but it's not going to make it. It's too low. So, another sort of misjudged sort of situation. And part of the reason for that is the way the shuttle is sort of rolling in order to try to get to uh, Cape Canaveral. It was producing more drag than it had in the previous version. And so, because it produced more drag when it rolled, it fell short of where it used to go. Anyway, which is how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to... Um, burn off extra energy when it's rolling like that. So it's good in a way, but it did cause problems for the script that I had to adjust for. Next up was the European lab, the Columbus lab on STS-122, the shuttle Atlantis, on February 7th, 2008. 
and this launch carried Commander Stephen Frake on his second and last space flight, uh, Pilot Alan Poindexter on his first, uh, mission specialists were Leland Melvin on his first, Rex Walheim on his second, Hans Schlegel on his second and last, uh, Stanley Love on his first, and Leopold Eihartz on his second and last. The EVAs were by Walheim and Love, the first one, the second one Walheim and Schlegel, and the third one by Walheim and Love again. So the Columbus Lab is, well, not all that dissimilar from the multi-purpose logistics modules that were carried to the station, which brings up the topic of the fact that in the course of this construction, of course, there were many other missions that visited the station with supplies like progresses and shuttles carried other internal equipment and other external equipment, small bits. And also the multi-purpose logistics mo modules or MPLMs that were carried in the shuttle bays. And in this case, I didn't have a good model of Columbus, so I just used the Leonardo multi-purpose logistics module as the mod uh, model of it. I might replace that later on because I think I have a better model now. But yeah, uh, the Columbus Lab looks vaguely like those logistics modules which are used to carry supplies. And Leonardo uh, eventually got turned into a permanent module to the station, we'll see that later on. So there's the return and the return was supposed to be to Kennedy and I didn't make it. And it was a splashdown. On the topic of whether the shuttle could actually splash down like this, probably not. Uh, certainly the crew would not survive the impact uh, of the G-forces. The shuttle itself uh, might... but it, It'd be not in great shape, let's put it that way. Anyway, the next launch is STS-123, the shuttle Endeavour carrying the Japanese... Well, one part of the Japanese lab, the Kibo Experiment Logistics Module, which is a sort of the top portion. It sits on top of the main part of the lab, and it's a pressurized experiment uh, stowage area and this was launched March 11th 2008 commander was Dominic Pudwell uh, sorry Dominic Pudwell Gori his fourth and last mission uh, pilot was Gregory Johnson first mission mission specialists were Robert Benkin first mission Michael Foreman first mission Richard Linehan fourth and last mission Atakao Doi second and last mission and Garrett Reisman first mission uh, there were five EVAs, Linehan and Reisman, second one was uh, Linehan Foreman, third one was Linehan Benkin, fourth one was Benkin Foreman, and fifth one was Benkin Foreman. And the return was to Kennedy on March 27th. So the Kibo Experiment Logistics Module was 8.5 tons and placed temporarily on Harmony, and then it's later going to be attached to the Kibo main module. And that's launching here on STS-124, the Shell Discovery. The main gem lab, this Kibo lab, is 15.9 tons. It's fairly large, and I think it's probably the heaviest module that the shuttle carried to the station. And this launched on May 31st, 2008. The commander was Mark Kelly, third mission. The pilot was Kenneth Ham, first mission. And the mission specialists were Karen Nyberg, her first mission, Ronald Garen Jr., his first mission, Michael Fossum, second mission, Akihiko Hoshide, first mission, and Gregory Chamatov, his first mission. Three EVAs were conducted, and they were all by Garen and Fossum. So here, of course, uh, I'm still using the tugs here, but at least we're docking the shuttle now. And you can see the physical size of the gem lab. It's very long voluminous and so we dock it to the common berthing mechanism on the side of of harmony there it's the port side and then we move the experiment logistics module onto the top of it onto the zenith side and there we go there is a third part to the kibo lab and that's the external experiment portion and uh, that will actually be done out of order i'll explain in a bit but here is the shuttle departing the station. And we are still missing one set of solar rays, and that's what's coming up next. But here, the shuttle is supposed to return to Kennedy, so we're headed for the right general location. And miss. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So another splashdown there. 
still working out the kinks in the script. So the next launch is SDS-119, the shuttle Discovery again, on March 15, 2009. So this is the next year. It is about a 10-month gap. And it is carrying the S6 truss and solar arrays. So finally, we'll have the truss completed. And that will look good. It'll dock to the S5 truss starboard side. This mission carried Commander Lee Archambault. Balt. It is his second and last mission. Pilot was Dominic Antonelli, uh, nicknamed Tony, first mission. Uh, mission specialists were Joseph Akaba, first mission. Steven Swanson, second mission. Richard Arnold, first mission. John L. Phillips, third and last mission. And Koichi Wakata, third mission. The EVAs were by, the first one was by Swanson and Arnold, second by Swanson and Akaba, and third by Akaba and Arnold. So, again the tugs, positioning the S6 truss. Now unfortunately I used different solar array models on the inner trusses and the outer trusses, so they look subtly different. You can see the difference in color there. I tried to match the length, but a little bit of a mistake in placing the original P6 truss. I used the wrong solar arrays for that. But anyway, there we go. We've got our solar trusses complete. Yes, except for the external storage platforms and the mobile base system. But, yep, looking good. Looking more like the International Space Station now. And so the shuttle returns. And uh, this is to Kennedy. So that is Florida in front of us, but you can see we're pretty low already. So we're not quite going to make it to Cape Canaveral. We end up uh, basically close to Tampa Bay. But at least we're on land again. <laughs> uh, we take what we can get sometimes. Now the next mission would be STS-127, the shuttle Endeavour carrying the Kibo Exposed Facility. But I didn't have a model of the Kibo Exposed Facility at the time, so I decided to do the following mission, uh, Poisk. This is uh, similar to Piers, which we didn't get to see because I missed, uh, I lost that video. But Poisk is a docking module. It is carried basically by the back end of a Progress. So the Poisk module is the front end of the Progress and then the rest of it is the service module of Progress and its control system. And launched of course by Soyuz U. And this launch occurred on November 10th, 2009. STS-127 with the Kibo Exposed Facility would have occurred July 15, 2009, so four months ahead of this. But right here, as we approach, we don't have that Exposed Facility on the station. But here, you can see this Poisk module being docked to Zvezda opposite piers. And once it successfully docks, then the rest of the progress, the progress service module and control system, separates from it and deorbits. The Poisk module is 3.7 tons. It's very similar to Poisk. I'm sure there are subtle differences as we see the station and the progress, especially designated progress, by the way, because it's different from other progresses. It's M-MIM2. But this launch then is STS-130, we still didn't get to STS-127 yet. Uh, STS-130, the Shuttle Endeavour, launched on February 8th, 2010, is carrying Tranquility and uh, the Cupola. So Tranquility is another living space module, and the Cupola allows the crew of the space station to see outside a little bit better. You may have seen photos of it, uh, of the view outside of it. And Tranquility is 13 tons, the Cupola is... 1.8 tons. The commander for the mission was George Zamka, his second and last mission. Uh, pilot was Terry Wirtz Jr., his first mission. And the mission specialists were Catherine Heyer, second and last mission. Uh, Stephen Robinson, fourth and last mission. Uh, Nicholas Patrick, second and last mission. And Robert Benkin, his second mission. All the EVAs, three of them, were conducted by Benkin and Patrick. Now, this required a little bit of shuffling because the cupola is on one end of Tranquility, but it needs to be placed on actually the bottom end. So instead of, I forget whether it's the um, port or starboard side, but it starts out on the port or starboard side and then ends up on the nadir side. So that's what we're doing there, replacing the cupola to the right position. 
and then the shuttle can depart. And this landing was to be at Kennedy, and we'll see if we can make it. But basically, by this point, uh, with the landing at Kennedy on February 22nd, the major construction of the station is complete. These are the major modules that were originally planned. And nope, didn't make it, landing somewhere else in Florida, from the look of it. One module still hasn't been delivered, uh, Nauka was originally planned and is not yet at the station. But anyway, continuing on, this is finally the launch of STS-127, the Shell Endeavor carrying the Kibo Exposed Facility, which is just a 2.5 ton pallet, 2.5 ton pallet that has little experiment blocks, cubes on it. And this launched on July 15, 2009, so um, seven months before the Tranquility arrival. And the commander for this mission was Mark Polanski, his third and last mission. The pilot was Doug Hurley, his first mission. The mission specialists were Chris Cassidy, his first mission. Julie Payette, her second and last mission. Thomas Marshburn, his first mission. David Wolf, fourth and last mission. And Timothy Copra, his first mission. Five EVAs were conducted. Not all of them had to do with the Kibo exposed facility, but uh, Wolf and Copra had the first. Wolf and Marshburn had the second. Wolf and Cassidy had the third, Cassidy and Marshburn had the fourth, and the fifth was also Cassidy and Marshburn. So here we come in for docking, and the Kibo exposed facility goes at the end of Kibo. And you can see, actually I needed to place a little docking port, something for it to attach to. So I had a Kerbal a do and EVA, grab the docking port, place the docking port on the Kibo module right there and then the Kibo module could be docked to the correct location, the Kibo Exposed Facility. So there's three parts to Kibo. So there's the outside one. You can see the cylindrical things on the side, the little gray cylindrical things that the experiments actually get attached to. Kibo also has a robotic arm, just like Canada arm, and it uses that to grab the experiments from the HTV's unpressurized section, I think. And the HTV is the Japanese supply vessel for the station. As you can see here, we're moving PMA-3. Uh, PMA-3 moves all over the place, and that's the status of the station right there. So the arm on Kibo will grab the experiments from the HTV and place them on the exposed facility as necessary. Or, you know, astronauts could do it, I suppose. But I don't know which way it goes. Here, taking manual control, but still uh, oh no, no, there's the runway, okay. So we managed to get there this time. This STS-127 was supposed to land at Kennedy, so good times, on uh, July 31st, 2009. The next launch is Atlantis STS-132 with, with the RASVIT module. RASVIT was a mini research module, uh, also can serve as a docking module, but a mini research module 6.3 tons launched on May 14, 2010, docked to Zarya's nadir. Uh, the commander was Kenneth Ham, second and last mission. Dominic Antonelli uh, was the pilot, second and last mission. Uh, mission specialists were Garrett Reisman, his second and last mission. Michael Good, second and last mission. Stephen Bowen, second mission. And Pierre Sellers, third and last mission. So the first EVA was by Reisman and Bowen. Second by Bowen and Good, and third Good and Reisman. So here's the shuttle docking at the station. Here we get some good views of the station as it's nearing completion, and the rest of it module will be placed by the little tugs. That's what it looks like, and there is the nadir side of Zarya. Trying to get a connection here. And there we go. All right. That business taken care of. The shuttle departs before landing at Kennedy Space Center again. The station looking very much like the station that we know. And can we make the runway? You might have noticed that the tugs are looking a little bit different because I did make the special model for them this time. And yes, there is the runway. 
I did uh, neglect uh, some additional missions that carried the um, logistics carriers. The Express Logistics Carrier 1 and 2 were launched on STS-129, the Shell Atlantis. I didn't cover those in the process of my construction. So there are things like that that I've neglected. But I tried not to neglect any major modules. Uh, this last is STS-133, the Shell Discovery, carrying the Leonardo permanent uh, multipurpose module. Leonardo was one of the multipurpose logistics modules that were carried to the station with supplies periodically. But since the shuttle was going to be retired, uh, this launch on February 24th, 2011, decided to permanently attach Leonardo so that they would have more space on the station for those supplies. Just uh, keep Leonardo there instead of constantly bringing it back and forth. So this uh, Leonardo module was docked to the forward docking point on Tranquility, and the commander was Stephen Lindsay, his fifth and last mission. Pilot was Eric Boa, second mission, and the mission specialists were Nicole Stott, her second and last mission, Alvin Drew, second and last mission, Michael Barrett, second mission, and Stephen Bowen, third mission. The EVAs were, there were two EVAs, both conducted by Bowen and Drew. So here, uh, this should look familiar, as I used the same model for the Columbus Lab. And it was moved about a bit, and there's all sorts of moving things here and there, as we also moved the PMA-3 to a position on Harmony. There we go. And the shuttle departs. Subsequent to this, but not covered by my own construction process, was STS-134, the shuttle Endeavour, carrying the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer 2, and uh, Express Logistics Carrier 3, and that was on May 16th, 2011, that was the launch. So that not covered because it wasn't really a major module. And what we will cover though is one other addition to the station, which was the beam module, which was launched not on a shuttle, but on a Falcon 9. But here we are landing at Cape Canaveral, and it is supposed to be a landing at Kennedy here. Not runway 9 though, it's supposed to be runway 15, but anyway, I didn't have a runway 15. And there we go. Looking good. Getting smoother, I'm sure if we had 100 more missions it'd look perfect. But anyway, let's take a quick look at the station again. I got a cinematic shot of the station and then we proceed with the CRS-8 mission, the Dragon on Falcon 9, which carried the beam module in its trunk. The beam module was only 1.4 tons, but it was a demonstration of the ability to create an inflatable habitat module. It was only a small inflatable habitat module, but it was a proof of concept by Bigelow Aerospace. This launch was on April 8th, 2016. So, four years after the other missions that we've seen. Now, of course, we have here retired the shuttle, and I didn't leave the tugs on the station, and this is not carrying the tugs. So, for this mission, for the placement of beam, I had to use Canadarm 2 on the station. So, we are back to doing that. And, in fact, that process took something like three hours to place the beam module. You can see it in there, uh, tucked into the dragon trunk. Rather convenient, actually. The trunk's design is well thought out. And here we are approaching. Now, uh, for these uh, supply vessels and all, they wouldn't dock themselves. They were actually brought in by an arm. The only uh, ship that docks itself is Progress. Well, and Soyuz, of course. Uh, those are automated, but otherwise HTV, ATV... Uh, I think ATV is automated, uh, is, uh, uses the arm, sorry, is, uses the arm, and a dragon all involved the arm pulling them in. But here we are docking the beam to the station. You can see the cupola right there it is obviously on the wrong side, it should be downward facing, facing the earth, but uh, yeah, our orientation always ends up wrong somehow despite use of persistent rotation. 
I don't know how it happens. But anyway, there we go, the inflation of beam. And that concludes the construction of the International Space Station as I did it in Kerbal Space Program. And so with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.